I had a hard time with numbers growing up, but words have always been my friend and uh, solace, actually, for me. I think, you know, the, my first memories of having a personal relationship with reading probably started with, like, Where the Red Fern Grows and Pope Joan. There were books that kind of led me to understanding that I wanted to put words on a page myself. And anytime I felt um, like retreating or sort of going somewhere else, it was easy to do so in a book. I remember the first book that I really, really fell in love with and that kind of made me understand that this was um, something that I'm never gonna have enough time in my life for. Like that, I, that there is just a sort of bottomless, unending source that was available to me was through uh, Steinbeck. I read Cannery Row and I was just like, okay, well, I'm gonna read everything he's ever written because I just want to be with this person. I want to hear his voice in my dreams. Like I want, uh, yeah, anyway, so that was my first obsession. And, then, and, then, and that was like probably beyond like all of the sort of little kid novels, um, the first time that I was like hungry, sort of insatiable. And I feel really lucky for that too. Like uh, I read the whole of East of Eden on a plane. Like I was going to Shanghai and it was a really long flight and I was claustrophobic on the plane. I was 16 or 17 and I had teenage anxiety. I think I got through two thirds of East of Eden in a, you know, 15 hour period because I just was like, if I just stay here, I'll be okay. <laughs> and um, that's for me like the big book. That is, that is uh, he's, he's one of my all time favorites, just a, a real hero. Um, somebody that I love so much, I feel like I know him. But that book is so foundational. And I also have like a strong connection to California. There's a chance my heart is in the shape of California. I didn't really know my grandfather. And so I had Steinbeck instead. I just learned so many lessons from that book and continue to. I've read that book. Um, I've read that book out loud twice and I've read it probably like six or seven times to myself. I can't remember how I found uh, Cannery Row. I guess maybe it was like kind of bolstered by a teacher that I had in the sixth grade. And I just never liked school until then. But um, she was like social studies and English. I think this kind of coincided with the time in my life that I started to become really obsessed with, with reading and not just sort of my own journals, but actually really engaging with authors and stuff. I think um, she, has a, she has a lot to do with that. So when I was a freshman in high school, I read on the road and um, I also had a meeting with the director that was gonna ad adapt the novel. And um, it's funny, I look, I look back on my relationship with On the Road and how I held these men in such high esteem because they just lived life to the fullest. And um, I love On the Road and, and I love all, all of the avenues that it took me down and all the different writers that it has led me to. And, and I loved making that, I loved working on that movie with that group of people. And um, as I get older, I think that what I'm really obsessed with is their sort of uh, repossession of form. Um, their lifestyles were like wild and crazy and they like, you know, ran around a lot and, and were reckless and, and it, 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 sort of constantly chasing the it of it all. Sort of um, just hungry, sort of voracious uh, people. I, I always was really inspired by that. But as a grown up person, I think that what I was really attracted to was somebody taking a sentence and just deconstructing it, turning it inside out, making it theirs, making it physical. It's such a rhythmic, book and that whole kind of um, area in, in literature is it has, it has an instinct and, and a, and a quick-footed sort of inclination. And I think that most things that are exceptionally true are impulsive, or at least it makes sense that that's where I started. So I just read St. Joan of Arc by Vita, and I've never read anything else by her. Um, I just bought everything she's ever written. I'm so intrigued by this person. There's a sort of pragmatism to her writing, but sort of an awareness of the small and tender things in a way that feels very protected. I think that she is somebody that, and I could be wrong, I need to sort of learn more about this person. I'm so curious about her, but she seems protective of her intellect, very proud of it. And it seems like it's being broadcast. It just makes sense considering, you know, I think she was writing in like the 20s and wasn't it, it wasn't like the easiest time c comparatively. It's hard to generalize, but for a woman at that time having having a voice and having it be so loud, she just feels like this undeniable force. And when I read 
the biography, I had been inspired to read St. Joan of Arc by a book called The Chronology of Water. And Lydia Yukonovich, who wrote that book, it's a, it's a memoir. She, she talks about a lot of the books in her life, this being a really, really seminal and foundational f formative experience reading this thing. And I just can't really believe that it happened. There is something about believing in something so much, so hard, and sort of just making mountains move and making men change. There are a few lines in it that are so striking. There's one about um, that she changed the minds of men, or if they couldn't change her mind, then they would destroy her body. It moved me to the core. And you could have written that story in so many different ways. And the way she decided to talk about her was so cool. It just said so much more. It just, it was so much more than historical fiction to me. All we do is make up stories. That's how we live. That's how we survive. That's how we make it through. Everyone's narrative is different. And so for her to impose hers with the strength that she did, I just can't believe, the power that she had is just like, it's miraculous. It feels like an absolute miracle. And it also feels like insanity, which sometimes, obviously, it's really hard to tell the difference between those two things. Um, we were just talking about some people being from another place. Tilda, Bowie, Didion, they're like alien people. I feel like when I read anything that Joan has written, that I'm, I'm getting a skewed sort of um, sideways glance at things that I usually just see straight on. And, and somehow she's always able to help you kind of step to the right or left and see it from an odd angle. And then really just shed new light on things that feel normal to me. It's like she has a almost sinister take on things that feel kind of unanimously accepted. And she's always able to sort of remind you of things like that. I don't know. I think even just her physicality beyond the words, you look at that person and you just imagine what it would be like to live in there. That voice, that particular voice, there is no one like her. I don't feel like any of it is even close to derivative. Everything feels original. All of it feels like thought bubbles from, from another planet. I, I just, I love that person so, so, so much. And I, and I love her kind of obsession with flow, process, how things work. I'm kind of an immediate, very present, really kind of to a fault, uh, momentary person. And, um, you know, our strengths are our weaknesses and our weaknesses can be our strengths. And so that's like cool for me, but, but I love how she will dissect, you know, the Hoover Dam. How does it work? How, all that power, keeping all that power in, like just her sort of like, be, her being taken with how freeways work. Stuff like that, I'm like, I would never think like that. And then making it somehow really personal and making it almost like, you know, she's writing about freeways, but she's writing about us. She's writing about people all the time. I, I always wonder if there's a movie somewhere a sort of untapped resource or a story that hasn't found its way out yet. Or Van Gogh's, uh, I don't know if I said that right, but Van Gogh's letters, to his, they're all to his brother. So Henry Miller's really obsessed with them. And I'm really obsessed with him. And through him found Anais and these particular letters. It's just the way that he describes them, sort of asking his brother for paints and, and to, to really invite him to love painting and, and things that are beautiful as much as he does, but how kind of untouchable that particular fascination and passion is. It's so his, he can't, he can barely, he feels like he can barely share it. And when he articulates that, you just go, it's okay because you made all of these paintings and we do share it with you. But it's like this frustration of not being able to externalize something that is inside of you that feels really urgent and kind of scary. And there's just a tenderness to it, that, to, the, to those letters that I find really, really, really endearing. I think my kind of obsession with like autobiographical stuff, most writers, when they talk about writing, um, or at least like, I guess the sort of conversation that I'm thinking of now is that classically it's like, oh, you write what you know, or, you know, I've just heard a lot of people voice frustration and being like, yeah, but you can make stuff up too, and that can still be your story. And, uh, I do find that every single time I get obsessed with one writer and you read sort of a slew of, of their books, and if you read them in order, 
they all feel like there's like a through line. Like I'm obsessed with Lydia Yuknovich. She, I'm really obsessed with her memoir. Every one of her novels is a different iteration of that story. I feel like she's written all over her body. And that's what we get to have of her. I feel that way with the writers that I've really just beca be become obsessed with. Like Bukowski is somebody that writes about himself a lot. And Ham on Rye is one of my favorite books of all time. It's sort of like from the perspective of a very young kid growing up. And it just feels so visceral and so real and, and, and about so much more than just him. Like, I think I just want to read private things. And then also feel like, uh, I don't know, you can kind of like decode messaging and find submerged stories and subliminal things that maybe they didn't even know about. And you're like, ooh, it's like you sort of turn into an analyst and read people's journals. So Sapiens and Homo Deus was really helpful for me because I classically kind of have a chip on my shoulder for, I, I decided to make a bunch of movies and not go to college. And so it was really nice for me to be given something I could hold in my hands and kind of help me zoom out. I'm somebody that becomes so fixated on detail and so kind of lost in them. Uh, it was just really, really cool to have somebody like hold my hand and go, I think you need to step back a little bit. <laughs> and uh, I think the Homo Deus particularly because it is a brief history of tomorrow. Honestly, it just blew my head off. You know, we all get really obsessed with ourselves. We all get so swept up in the idea of individuality. And I love that. That's how we all get to make art and relate to each other and all of that. But it is nice to know that you are a part of a very large whole and that we've wound up here and that it is so chaotic. And certain things that we do, certain things that we believe, all the conditioning, all, all of the ways in which we've wound up here, those things are not always things that you think about day to day. It was a fun thing to read alongside this movie that I did called Love Me, about sort of deconstructing the idea of um, sort of uh, individuality, knowing that we all kind of like, we have a me in there, obviously, but at the same time, what is that? Does that even exist? Is that something that we've made up? Bluettes is one of the most achy books <laughs> that I have ever read. I got really stuck on that one. <laughs> Um, I've given that book to a thousand people. I think I read it during a time where I was maybe experiencing some heartache. And her kind of allegorical take, like her, her true obsession with a color, it just, it was the only way that I could fathom expressing that type of like loss feeling, that feeling of your heart has been taken out of your body and put somewhere else. And that it's a color that's everywhere and permeates your entire existence and you can't get away from it, but you're also in love with it. And I, the whole thing just felt like she was able to take joy and sorrow and make them the exact same thing. I love that book. I, that, that one, East of Eden, Bluettes, those are the ones that I've read the most. Just Kids should have been on my list, really. I, 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 love, I love that book so much. I've been lucky enough to share some space with, with Patty, and I had already, I had, read, I had read Just Kids, and then I was at a party being sad, and she came up to me, tapped me on the shoulder. I think it was actually at the after party for the Met Ball, which couldn't have been the more, like, a, a more perfect place to be in the boom boom room and go, I don't think I'm in the right spot right now. And then have Patti Smith tap you on the shoulder and go, we're all here for you. And by we, she meant like us, like the people that are for you will always be for you. And we're right here. I think I didn't say anything. I think my mouth kind of just sort of dropped open and I just went like, Thank you, I love you. <laughs> and she went, and then the next time I saw her was in New York and she said, you know, I had a feeling you were here and I came out to find you and here you are. She's somebody that loves other artists, is an unabashed fan. And then when you read Just Kids, her sort of going after the people that she reveres, the people that she looks up to, her heroes, are people that she seeks out. I have always, like since then, sent her bits of writing, asked her questions, sort of pursued her so annoying. I just want to make that movie so badly. <laughs> I have plagued her in regards to Just Kids. That's something that is, a, is going to be a longer story for her to, to tell. I'm so curious to see how that finds multiplicity in art. I know at some point somebody will film that, but I, lo I, I love her so much. Um, there are certain people that just make it feel okay 
uh, to have voice. And sometimes it's so hard to find your own and you just talk to the right person and suddenly you're screaming and she is that person. For so many people too, I'm not special. She, she, that's a God-given talent. That is something you are born with. And you know, when I say God, I don't really know what that is anyway. So that's something that is a cellular thing. Most of the writers that I really, really dig have that too. Henry Miller has a book called My Life in Books, where he just talks about the books that he's read in his life that he wants to give people and the sweetness in which he writes and the kind of, um, just the unembarrassed kind of soul splurged. Just being such a fan of things really says a lot about a person. And when you're willing to like, not willing to express, but you're, you're, you so need to share that with other people. It's the only way, it's the only way to live with it. Like you can't live with it alone. I love people like that. Uh, what books have really made me cry? Um, me and my girlfriend read Withering Heights out loud. And there are, there are a couple, there are a couple lines in that book that made us both lose it. There's just sort of a steadfast commitment to love psychosis. There's such an alienating love story there. Maybe this is totally cliche, but when you really, really think that you have found the person, it's a secret. It's an, it's, it's a literally an impenetrable, impossible to share or describe to anyone that is not that person, or even not that person, just to yourself, that Heathcliff really, really smacks right, right on the head very hard. There are just certain things that he says that are like so, <laughs> so just ridiculously committed to feeling um, that I loved. And uh, let's see, I read the first chapter of The Jungle Book recently, and it, it made me like really ugly cry, <laughs> like really kind of choke on a few tears. Bluettes was, I was, I was read in a period of time where I was crying a lot. So I don't know if it was the book or just the life that was going on alongside the book. I'm actually reading a book right now called Tree. And it's from the perspective of a California live oak. And it describes an ecosystem and kind of relates that to being alive and sentient in any way, shape, or form, whether you are a plant or an animal or a person, a man, a woman. It strips away pretty much everything and connects us all. And the first couple chapters of that, I was kind of weeping throughout because you also feel this like sort of ecological loss while reading it, which is what we've done with our earth. And, and um, just per personalizing the perspective of this tree, and I, it was so stunning. That's something you should definitely pick up. I've never read anything like that. It actually reminds me of Homo Deus and Sapiens. It's a completely different book, it's a novel, but there's something about sort of paying credence to our sameness and the kind of permeation of love that is available if you want it. Um, it's described really well. There's a poem that I wanted to read. It's interesting, I, I, I do actually have a a really developed relationship with like very strong American male writers, but they're all the really sweet, tender boys. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and there is a Bukowski poem that I read to my girlfriend. We went to this sushi restaurant in Los Angeles and all these photographers like got out of this, all of a sudden just sort of materialized. And she was about to get out of the car and she was like, oh, we better run into this restaurant. I was like, no, no, hold on, close the door. And I pulled it, I happened to have uh, a collection of Bukowski's poems called You Get So Alone at Times, It Just Makes Sense. And there's a poem in that book that I was like, I know this is weird, but just chill with me for one second and listen to this. <laughs> and I'm gonna read that poem right now. And in the face of such ridiculous like absurdity, it just made so much sense. So yeah, it's called No Help For That. There is a place in the heart that will never be filled, a space. And even during the best moments and the greatest times, we will know it. We will know it more than ever. There is a place in the heart that will never be filled and we will wait and wait in that space. And so for somebody who's, you know, a kind of like raging alcoholic American brute, it's, he's, so, on, I, he's so touching. And also just like that strikingly scarily true. You're just like, oh no. There is a part that we will always be digging for, trying to share, and that's the reason we will always be writing books and making paintings and making movies and trying to get that out, but 
There's always that little spot that you just can't get to. Yeah, I love that man. <laughs>